Yeah. How do you just follow what just happened up here? Oh my gosh. Was that incredible? What a story. Anyway, um, what I'd like to do to get started this morning is uh, I'd like to pray. And I have probably 30 different things going through my mind and heart that I feel are pertinent, necessary, needful. And so I've got to narrow it all down and focus. Okay? So we're going to pray. We're going to ask God to do a supernatural thing and bring this all into a nice, cohesive message that will equip you, encourage you, and uh, maybe help motivate you. All right, let's stand. And we just got seated. Let's stand. Let's pray. I want everybody praying. We're a Pentecostal, right? Is this a Pentecostal? Okay, so speak in tongues. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the Holy Ghost. Lord, we thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit who has come to abide with us forever. Lord, we thank you, God, for the empowering, for the life force, for everything that he brings to our aid. Today, Lord, we declare we submit ourselves to you. We submit ourselves to your rule, to your government. And we resist hell and the lies and everything that he would try to advance, to oppose your rule in this earth. And God, we receive right now a fresh revelation of us as sons and daughters and the authority that you grant us in this planet. God, I'm asking that by the spirit of revelation, you will reawaken in us the reality of our sonship. God, the ability to shift and change, not just atmospheres, but entire cities and regions. Lord, I'm asking you to begin to mobilize your people. And God, move them into alignment. God, baptize them into groups of people that they're destined to connect with, Lord, to, for synergistic influence in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. All right. All right, guys, listen. Um, I'm just taking a look. One of the founding fathers said, don't shoot till you see the whites of their eyes. All right, so it's always been a challenge for me to do Zoom calls and stuff like that because there's nobody in the room. And uh, so it's really hard to get inspired. But anyway, listen, I want to start out. I want to share a couple things with you. I wanna, we're going to go to the Word of God, I promise you. And uh, take a look because there's something about the Word of God that uh, I, I feel like God is just breathing afresh and anew. I know for a season of time it seems like there's been a Holy Ghost emphasis upon prophetic, revelatory ministry and words and, and all of that that has come forth has been very encouraging. And I'm going to share some of those things with you. But also, it's like I'm rediscovering, you know, this is, these, these are called the, the, the scriptures of prophecy. This is, this is like a, a prophetic oracle from Genesis through Revelations. And, um, and I want to share a story with you that happened to me in my early ministry years because God wanted to, to, to establish a foundation and an understanding in me at the very onset of our ministry in our life. So this was our first church pioneer effort. Cindy and I uh, were married, 26 years old, <laughs> young, <laughs> and uh, um, we had dated, I think, for almost a year, not quite a year, and uh, anyway, it was uh, a crazy time. Our first date, by the way, she called me up and said, hey, we're going to George Harrison concert, and we're going to witness, and I said, What? She said, we're going to George Harrison and Ravi Shankar, and we're going to witness. I said, ah, sounds like a night. So we loaded up in a Volkswagen van. We were hippies. And uh, 
we drove to Fort Worth, Texas, and uh, what she neglected to tell me is that she didn't have any money. Well, that's, that's been kind of a pattern. <clears throat> we went to India. She insisted we go to India. We get there, $200 in our pocket. That's all we've got. So here we are at a concert, no money, no way to get in, and we're like, what do we do now? So I started witnessing to the ticket taker at the door, who was a backslidden Methodist sitting there drinking a quart of beer. It's Texas. All right. So I started talking to him about Jesus, and he the conviction of God is settling in on him. He's squirming, literally. I mean, like shifting in his seat. Miserable. Finally, he says, here, take these tickets and go in. Just don't sit in those seats. So we went in, preached, witnessed, did whatever you do. It's a bunch of crazy kids. And anyway, that was our, that was our first date. That was like God saying, hey, <laughs> little snapshot of things to come pal all right so fast forward we're married we're in Utah um the only thing I knew about Utah was Mormons I knew there were Mormons there and that was it I didn't know what they were I thought they were like Mennonites you know Uh, my wife Cindy thought they were a choir yeah so, we're in Utah, and uh, I want to start a church. I mean, there's something on the inside of me. I want to plan a church. Christ for the Nations is where we attended early on, okay? Gordon and Frida Lindsay were still alive, and very much alive and kicking. And uh, so, what they did for us is they put on the inside of us, go ye... And don't you ever come back ye. Okay? So we we had this this thing, this burning thing on the inside of us. Because you have to understand the institution at that time, Gordon and Frida would bring people into that, into that school. And it was only 260, 70 kids at the time who came out of the healing revival movement. These were guys like David Nunn. T.L. Osborne, I mean, I can go down the list of these people. They would come into the, into the group, and I, I'm a novice. I'm maybe six months saved. It, you know, pagan wouldn't describe my lifestyle before I got saved, all right? So I'm in here, and I don't understand anything. The first day I'm there, the director of the school is up there, on the stage, and the worship is playing, and he begins to cry. He's he's a man, and he's, I'm not used, men don't cry. He's up there weeping, and I was convinced he was weeping over the sin of my life. (laughs) I felt, I'm in the wrong place, man. (laughs) This guy's reading my mail. These guys come in, and they begin to preach. And the anointing of God is so palpable as they begin. And and the message was simply this. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he was raising the dead 2,000 years ago, he should be raising the dead today. So they were far more eloquent than that. David Nunn, I remember, he would teach, but he would teach through preaching. And for any of the old-timers here who actually saw David Nunn or knew him, he looked like a drill instructor. He was about this tall and about this wide. And he preached like a drill instructor. I mean, there was a fiery passion, and the words came out, and you could literally feel in the atmosphere as they're preaching the level of faith go up in the room. Because I always wondered how these guys could pack out tents with 30,000 people. 
night after night after night after night with dump trucks after the meetings, backing up to the tents and carrying away hospital beds and crutches and all the things. They would empty out hospitals. How did they do this? I'm sitting there listening and I feel the atmosphere shift and change as the anointing. And it wasn't, it wasn't like the gift of healings or miracles. It was the gift of faith. With God, there shall nothing be impossible. I'm on the edge of my seat, 19, 20 year old kid, just like, oh my gosh, everything I read in a book called Like a Mighty Wind by Mil Tari, it's, it's like happening right now in front of me. David Nunn finishes, and one of the deaf students walked up in front. There's over 800 people there, stands in front of him. And he's like, who, who is she and why is she up here? And so one of the students, in so many words, explained to him, uh, evangelist, uh, none, it's time to put up or shut up. She's deaf. And uh, I mean, she's like deaf, born deaf, right? He didn't miss a lick. I mean, he did the Oral Roberts thing, you know, where they put their middle fingers in their ears. <laughs> you know, he puts it in her ears. <clears throat> and I never heard anybody pray like that in my life. I mean, the Bible says the fervent, effectual prayers of righteous men and women make much power available, mighty in its working. He prayed pulled his fingers out of her ears. She screamed, I can hear, I can hear. And waves of the power of God went through the room. And with each wave, the level of faith went up in the room. That's what we were born, born into. That's what came through. And so that put something on the inside of us of go ye and don't you ever come back ye. All right, so we're in Provo, Utah. Provo, Utah has a lot of Mormons, like 98% Mormon when we were there. I was, uh, my family, I believe we were the 2% that were not Mormon. <laughs> and uh, so uh, Christ for the Nations did a great job on teaching us the Bible, giving us an understanding of gifts but they never taught us how to pioneer churches. It just wasn't part of the curriculum. And so we don't know what we're doing. I don't know what I'm doing. I have no clue. I thought, well, let's, let's advertise to the world that we're starting a Pentecostal church in the middle of Mormon town. I'm sure they'll love it. We sit down for the interview, and it is the great, great granddaughter of Brigham Young. He had 20 wives, so I can only imagine she's one of 2,000. She is not real amicable towards us. She looks at me and she says, why does Provo Orem need a charismatic church? And I, some cock and bull story I pulled out of nowhere. <clears throat> And uh, <laughs> anyway, you ought to go back and read the article. Anyway, so anyway, it went out. We, we had enough money to rent a space that was called the Women's County Cultural Center. And so we went in, we had enough money, and they worked with me. I said, I, how much does it cost to rent? She says, well, it's this amount, month if you do a lease. You know, you know how it goes. I said, how much just for a week? And she said, well, that'll be X amount of dollars. I said, could I rent it week by week? And she said, all right. She wasn't a Mormon, all right? So she says, ah, okay, she's Christian science. <laughs> <clears throat> so I, 
I gave him the money for the first week. Okay, we announce in the paper that we're starting a, uh, a mega church. Of course, that's my vision. And uh, Sunday morning, I've got my daughter there. She's probably under two years old. I have my wife there. We've let everybody know that our church starts at 10.30. <clears throat> at 10.15, nobody's in the parking lot. It looks like my church is going to be my wife and my 18-month-old daughter. 10.28, a car pulls into the parking lot, and two people get out. They walk in, and I think, oh, my gosh, it's revival. <laughs> they came in, <clears throat> and so we have this huge room, probably about half the size of this, this auditorium here, about huge room. We have four chairs in the middle of this huge room. Cindy leads worship. She was the only one singing. We were kind of like, you know, it's a little awkward, four people staring at each other. Right? We were, we were four square. <laughs> Literally. And uh, she led worship. I preached. I took up the offering. We had enough money to pay for that Sunday and a bite to eat afterwards. Anyway, so, so that was our start. So we were three years in Provo, Utah. And I want to share an experience I had with you because what we didn't understand is we didn't understand the nature of spiritual warfare. We didn't understand the fact that, you know, every step you take is contested territory. We didn't get the fact that, you know, the, not just the subtlety of how hell works, but also how it plays out in our human experience, all right? So I'm, I'm, because of time, I'm just, I'm going to race through some of the details, but just stick with me. So we're ministering, and we are starting a church, and, and it's growing, all right? And, but I'm working construction up in Salt Lake City. So we have one car. So I, I leave every morning, my wife and, and, and my young daughter, I drive up to Salt Lake City through snow. I mean, some of the worst territory in Utah. I drive through to get to my job and come home. So this is fun. So I'm earning enough money, barely, just to put food on the table. You know how it goes. Those of you who pioneered churches, you, you know, without any backing, I'm telling you, it was rough. In fact, I hate for this to get out, but we noticed that when people came over and sat on our couch, it was an older couch, right? Well, their feet would kind of go up a little bit because, you know, the butt goes down and the feet go up. Well, there was change in the couch after they left. <laughs> I, I had to repent of stealing. But, I, but who knows? Anyway. So uh, we consider that milk money. Anyway, that's slightly exaggerated, but not too far. Um, things are tight. So every dime that came into the house, we would spend on just survival. Well, you know what? Unfortunately, the IRS, their name never came out of the hat. You know, we just thought, <clears throat> we need it more than they do. Well, they didn't see things that way. Okay? And they were not compassionate at all. And the only ones who were worse than the IRS was the state income tax. They were even worse. And so, and then on top of it, my wife is pregnant. She, um, and the only way we can have kids uh, for medical reasons was through C-section. All right? So we have found an insurance company that will support this 
pregnancy knowing that she has to have a C-section. So month after month, we scrape together the money to, you know, to make the insurance payment. We're six months, seven months into the thing. We get a letter from the insurance company saying, uh, well, we're bankrupt. And so all the money that we, they're, they're not viable. We have the child and the insurance company is not paying. So now we have not only the IRS coming after us and the state income tax coming after us, but we have doctors and hospital bills. And I'm trying to pioneer a church in Provo, Utah with 98% Mormon and people who believe that I'm a hireling of Satan because I receive a salary for doing ministry. Can I tell you, as a 28-year-old kid, I am overwhelmed. I mean, I am up at nights. We just had a series of incidents happen that were just, I'm telling you, it was just so erosive at the vision and the hope and the passion and the desire. It was warfare. And I woke up, and I thought, I'm, I've, I'm just going to go to the office. When all else fails, go to the office. Went to the office. I rented a space in this building. One side of me is the Utah Musicians Guild. It's the union. The only people they have in the union are the Osmonds. Okay? <laughs> all right? And over here, on the other side of my office, I have the corner office. I'm important. At the corner office, and over here is the Utah Board of Contractors. So I'm in my office, and, and I'm overwhelmed. Because all I can hear in my mind, state income tax, federal income, they're levying my account. I, I go to spend something, and they've gone in, and they've cleaned me out. And I go to the IRS, and I said, you idiots. I have babies. I turned my babies loose inside of the IRS building. They're turning the lights on and off. They are disrupting everything. Do you see that? You did that. You think I'm exaggerating. I'm in my office. I'm overwhelmed. And up on the wall, there's a plaque that we got for our uh, as, as a wedding present. And it was really cool because it was wood and it was leather. And the leather had burnt into it. 2 Corinthians 9.8. God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, abound unto every good work. I'm looking at that, and I'm thinking to myself, what a lie. Because I've got the IRS calling me. I've got the Utah tax. I've got hospitals. I've got, ins I mean, all of these. And, it's, and these are the only, the church isn't even calling me. I'm on first name basis with the guys down there at the Utah Tax Commission. Something rose up on the inside of me from my training at Christ for the Nations, and it was essentially this. Let God be true, and let everything else be a lie. And I, and I made, it was almost like a Holy Ghost resolve. Either that's true, or it's not. And I'm going to find out what is reality. So I began to pray inside of my office with the Utah Musicians Guild here and the Board of Utah or uh, contractors over here. I began to pray, and I thought, well, I should be probably a little subtle. But the more I prayed, and it was hard, guys. I mean, I felt no anointing, no inspiration. All I can hear is the screaming of the need. But I start praying, and, the, and I get angry. 
All right. I don't know if you've ever gotten that way. I'm just so stinking angry. It's it's Irish, I'm telling you. All right. I am angry. And so the tongues gets louder and louder and over and over again. It is written, because that's the way Jesus confronted hell. It is written, 2 Corinthians 9 8. God is able to make all grace abound towards me, that I always, having all sufficiency in all things, abound unto every good work. Over one hour, two hours, three hours, the Board of Utah contractors clears out. They think I'm having some kind of breakdown, I guess. <laughs> the old guy over here, the, the musician, he, yeah, he's out of there. So I have the place to myself. So five hours, six hours, I don't know how long I was in my office, over and over and over, declaring in the face of our need what God said about our circumstances. I went home. My wife is very creative, and because we had, you know, we didn't have a lot of money to spend on food. She would get very creative in what she put together. So, <laughs> we, I walked through the door, and my eyes started watering. And I'm like, honey, what, what's for dinner? She said, sweet and sour spam. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, my heart just soars like an eagle. All I can think about spam is that pink stuff that coats it. Anyway, so we sit down to a lovely dinner of sweet and sour spam, and I have to love it because after all, she fixed it. Well guys, that night I went to bed. And I had a dream. And in this dream, one of the neighbors gave me a pet parrot. It was green. And it followed me like a little puppy dog. You know, it was just like, and I thought, God, that is so stinking cute. Well, the moment I thought that, that parrot hopped up on my shoulder and kind of scooched up next to me and started squawking in my ear. And I'm like, God, that's really anointing. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going, and this thing keeps squawking and squawking. Now, act two, scene one, all right? I'm inside my house, and I discern that this parrot on my shoulder is not real. So I grab it, and I throw it into the fire in the fireplace. You might think that's a little radical. But I went over and I took a look and what had been a green animate parrot was now an old rusty horseshoe, lifeless. And I woke up and waves of the power of God were coming over me long before I ever knew about renewal or any of that stuff. This was a post or a pre-renewal experience. So I'm getting, this is three o'clock in the morning wave after wave, and I'm thinking, I don't know what I just dreamed, but somehow or another, God was tied to that. I woke up in the morning, the first phone call I got was not the IRS, was not state income tax, was not the doc, was none of that. It was a pastor up in Salt Lake City. Now, the day that I was in my office was February 8th, okay? So February 8th, this is on February 9th, the pastor calls up and said, hey, we have a Bible school, and I got up last night, which would have been Wednesday in the uh, evening. He said, I got up to take up an offering for our school. And he said, I started talking about you two down there in Provo. And, uh, you know, we just decided to take the offering up for you guys. And I was like, oh, my God. I'm grabbing my heart. Oh, my God. We feel so led to receive it. I just can't even begin to tell you. <laughs> We feel so led. <laughs> he 
drove down and he said, not only will we bring you, we'll take you out for lunch. I'm like, I'm grabbing Kleenex. Like, oh my God, we get, we get something other than sweet and sour spam. <laughs> he gets down there. And he, of course, he's got a Continental. Nice big car. We climb into these leather seats, and we're going out. And, and I have a check in my hand that they took up, and that was just so generous for us, you know. And I said, can you stop here at the post office box right here? I said, I, I just need to get all the mail before we go. So I hopped out of the back seat, grabbed the mail, and the church mail came to the house. You know how it is. <clears throat> So I started opening it up, bills, bills, bills. And I opened up one, and it was crazy. It had our address as a return address, and then our address as the sender address. And I'd made bills out several days before that, and I thought I sent one of the bills back to me. And, and I felt pretty good about it, you know, because I figured we probably needed it more than they did. Their cash flow, you know, mine. So I opened it up reached in and pulled it out and it's and it's a thing that looks like a check but it couldn't be a check because it's got too many zeros i've never seen anything with that many zeros on it and what i thought it was is we were getting because our insurance company went bankrupt we were getting all these promotional things from insurance companies you know how it goes so i thought oh this is nothing and i was getting ready to rip it up but i thought wait a minute here so i looked a little closer and it says cashier's check bank it's from a bank in tri-cities washington i i don't even i had never heard of tri-cities washington the guy on there i never i didn't know who that was i said i'm trying i'm not processing it it's it's like i'm like oh my god then i noticed it was dated february 8th and it dawned on me that this was not an advertisement. This was a check made out to Tim and Cindy McGill. I, I showed it to Cindy. She was sitting in the back seat with me. I watched tears shoot. <laughs> with what they took up for us in the Bible study and this offering that came in, pretty much put us in the black. Now, here's what I want to tell you. God began to talk to me about my dream. The parrot represented our circumstances. Our circumstances were the result of witchcraft because our neighbors and the city were praying against us. Mormons don't, I mean, they're, they're really committed to their task. They were, so this parrot hopped up on my shoulder, and day and night my circumstances were speaking in my ear. You're going to fail you're, you're going to go broke. You're going to be bankrupt. You're going to go, I mean, just all the, you, just everything that you can possibly imagine that comes with that kind of pressure. And the Lord said, you tried your circumstances in the fire of my word. Jeremiah says, it's not my word. What? Like unto a fire. I tried our circumstances in the fire of God's word, and it proved to be a lie. Let God be true, and let everything else be a lie. Now, here's the reality, guys. We live with our circumstances, and those circumstances are very, very real. But we have a higher reality. We have a transcendent truth. We have something that supersedes anything in this earth. 
And so what I feel, okay, because I'm going to share some of my experiences with you, prophetic experiences, because some of these are coming to pass right now. I had these back in 95. And right now, we are stepping into the reality of some of these things. What does it say in Psalms? What is it? 103, 104. God sent his word and tried them, right? Talking about Joseph. Sent his word and tried him. It's like some of these prophetic words that have been spoken over your life and all the circumstances in your life looks like they have warred against what you perceived was your destiny and your God-ordained identity in this earth. Paul wrote Timothy, and he said, Timothy, war, a good warfare by the prophecies that have gone before on your life. Well, how do we do that? The word of faith is nigh you, near you, even in your heart and in your mouth. And... uh, 1995, I, I had a dream. This was not uncommon because we were in the middle of a visitation of God. We were in a small town in Oregon called Reedsport. Anybody know where Reedsport, Oregon is? Well, you're very, you're a few people in a minority because it's not on the map. In fact, when I told Cindy we're taking an assignment in Reedsport, Oregon, She's like, where is that? And it's like, well, it's, it's on the coast. It'll be lovely. We came in to Reedsport, Oregon. It was probably 4,000 people. She's from Dallas, Texas. Okay, just think with me here. We come into a town of 4,000 people, and it's boarding up, all right? And she looks at me, and she said... I see red flags everywhere. And I'm like, oh, honey, nothing ventured, nothing gained. (laughs) She'd heard that one too many times before, (laughs) my pioneer efforts. Oh, honey, it's, it's awesome. She said, this isn't a city. It doesn't really qualify for a neighborhood. So we moved into Reedsport, Oregon. We got in there. We found out from them, you've got, this is your church, okay? Too long to go into the details. But what had happened is this was during the the Clinton-Gore administration, and our good friend Gore went in and shut down all the federal lands in Douglas County and Coos County for logging because of a white spotted owl. Plenty of trees in Oregon, trust me. Lots of trees. But for some reason, they felt like the trees in Douglas County and Coos County uh, needed to be a refuge for the white spotted owl, even though they're all over the stinking place. Well, what happened was, Families that had been in the logging industry and timber industry for five generations, five generations overnight were given a slip to go to the local community college and they shut down logging in the area. Just before we showed up, there were 72 uh, timber-related industries in the immediate area. By the time we got there, there were two. Alcohol, drugs, everything that goes with that kind of event had permeated the community, and that's what we stepped into. Um, We immediately began what we called PUSH. It was, you know, there's a 12-step program. The only thing that stuck with me from algebra was you reduce things down to the most simplest form. Am I wrong? Is that, isn't that algebra? You just take it down as, okay. So I thought 12 steps is like 11 too many. <laughs> so I boiled down my program to one step because that was more consistent with the way I think. I need things simple. And my 
my one-step program that I was going to sell to the church because I have no clue how to touch the pain that's in my community because they're not, they're not responding to the things that I have shared with them that the denomination had given to us to build a church. It just wasn't resonating with people whose lives are falling apart. I said, all right, guys, as of this day, I gave the day, we are starting push. And they're like, what is push? That sounds like work. I said, well, it's pray until something happens. That's my, that's my program. I'll sell thousands of books with it. <laughs> one page, one paragraph, push. For some reason, people bought into it because they were as desperate as I was. So anyway, we started push. Friday after Friday or Saturday, we would meet together in the sanctuary and we would, enter, and we would cry out to God. Week after week after week after week, nothing happening, nothing changing, nothing, nothing, nothing. Church is predictable. I love my church, but it's, oh my God, I could tell you who was going to stand up where and what they were going to say. And it wasn't prophetic because it had happened so many months before. Week after, we're pushing, we're pushing, we're pushing. Well, Cindy, this is in December, one of the darkest, dreariest, rainiest seasons we'd had in Oregon, which is, and uh, she stands up and says, I want to say something. I want to say something. The Lord just spoke to me and said, we've turned the corner and we're coming into a visitation of God. Everybody looked at her like, shut up. <laughs> shut up. We have heard that so many times. Oh my God, sit down. And uh, I led the parade. Honey, sit, sit down. Well, that's December, January. She says, I'm at the office. Okay, I'm at the office. It's my, it's my haven. I'm at the office. Oh my God, it's safe there. She calls me and says, you need to come home and you need to listen to this video tape I got from Morningstar. I said to her, I don't give a rip about Morningstar. By that time I was, listen, I just wasn't like discouraged. I was as far down in indifference as you can go. Okay. And so the idea of me coming home for lunch to listen to somebody tell me how to do my life was just not a real big priority to me. So she said, no, you need to listen to this. You need to listen. So fine. Okay, honey. So I'm eating my hot dog and she puts in this VHS and this guy comes up and he's got a mullet. <laughs> Business in the front, party in the back. And if that's not bad enough, he's from Texas. He's a redneck. And his name is Bobby Connor. I don't give a rip about Bobby Connor. I don't care that he's from Texas. And I certainly don't care about what he has to say. He starts preaching and there's... There's no continuity to it. He's just flitting out scriptures. And doesn't it say here? And isn't it true here? So he's flitting out all these scriptures. I'm getting... I'm, the indifference went back into anger. Just slipped out of indifference into anger. Because I'm sitting here and I like things that are structured. I like things that are organized. I want there to be point one, point two, point three, and a wonderful conclusion of application. None of that. <laughs> and then he 
he makes this declaration and he says, and doesn't it say in Psalms 92 and verse 10 that God will anoint your head with fresh oil and exalt your strength like that of a wild ox? Bam! Hit me right in the heart. And I knew in that moment of time by revelation what he was doing. He was prophesying over a group of people of over a thousand and he couldn't stand them in front of him so he just trusted the Holy Spirit for application. That was January. April. March, April. The rains had stopped. It was a beautiful day. I get a call at the office. I'm in my safe place. It's nice. I get a call in the office. It's my wife. I got a phone call from the school. Haley, our oldest daughter, has got ear infection. We're going to have to get her in. Well, this, by this time, this had happened every year. This is just on the calendar. Haley gets ear infection. Okay. So she goes down. It's one, you know, like one small clinic in the place and one hospital. So she's inside the clinic with Haley, waiting for the doctor to come in, you know, the little waiting room there. She's reading the TAM magazine. And she said, all of a sudden, it's like something begins to bubble up on the inside of her. And she'd been struggling with depression. Because this, this was hard, guys. I mean, we were trying to operate a church on $1,700 a month, and that includes any kind of salary that we could pull in. I'm going around business to business looking for a job, but that's 11% unemployment. Nobody's hiring, okay? It's, I'm telling you, it was... So she's, she gave up Delta Airlines to move to Reedsport, Oregon. They wanted to put her in, in management. She, listen, Cindy could sell freezers in the Arctic. And they know this. And they want her in management because she can motivate people. And she gave it up because I felt like we were supposed to go to this place. She's struggling with depression. And I mean, it's real. And she's in the doctor's office and she said, something's bubbling up on the inside of her. She said, it felt like a breakdown in reverse. She'd had her breakdown, and now it's like something's happening in reverse. She said it slowly just kind of broke down in reverse. How am I doing on time? Okay. All right. She started laughing. Exploded in laughter in the small clinic in Reedsport, Oregon. Can I tell you, they told me when I dropped my kids off at school at the first day, the secretary looked up at me and said, oh, by the way, if your kids get in trouble here, you'll find out about it before the principal. What I heard in that is that gossip will work for you or it will work against you, but it will work. Cindy, screaming, laughing, Shaking the Time magazine. My daughter, horrified. <laughs> Mom, shut up. Shut up. I will never get a date in this city. Shut up. She laughed so hard she slid out of the chair. She is now underneath the exam table and her legs are going like this and she's shaking the Time magazine. This went on, finally, finally, it subsided. She crawled to the floor, back to her chair, hair everywhere, mascara running and the door opens and it's the doctor like, dear God, who am I in here for? I got a phone call from Haley. Dad, Dad, you need to talk to Mom. Why? She weirded out in the doctor's office. I said, what do you mean she weirded out? She weirded out. She weirded out. Talk to her. Anyway, so I went, talked to her. We had no clue about Toronto or any of that stuff, all right? 
She explained to me what had happened, and I thought, oh my God, this is it. Because we had been doing our one-step program. Pray until something happens. <laughs> I have a dream. Okay, this is in the same time. I have a dr This dream thing is beginning to awaken on the inside of us. Joel says, in the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and people are going to have visionary experiences. I have a dream. And in the dream, Paul Kane walks up to me in the foyer of a large hotel and says, come up to my room, I have a word for you. And I'm like, oh, this is fairly serious. What have I done? I thought, that's what I'm thinking. Oh, what have I done? Oh, my God. He's... So anyway, we get up to his room, and he says, the Lord has a word for you. I thought, well, this is very official. I probably should get on my knees. So in the dream, I got on my knees. You know, I'm like, I'm in the receiving mode, whatever it is. I am in the posture of, be it unto me, O Lord, according to your word. He sticks his finger, his index finger, in my rib cage. I mean, bam, and it hurts because it's not gentle. And he begins to prophesy, this day the Lord is changing your name to Ephraim. And I'm like, a name change. And on the couch, my wife is there with my mom, and they are talking with each other about what's going on, back and forth. And I'm like, shut up. I can't hear what he's saying. Shut up. And I come out of this thing. Well, I get up. I look in the, you know, I thought Ephraim is another name for God, for Israel. Israel's God's servant. God just reaffirming my position as a servant. Awesome. But something pushed me a little further. It said, no, no, no. So I went and I just searched it out. And I found out it's Joseph's second son. And at his birth, he declared, the Lord has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. It literally means double fruit. That's April. August of the same year. I've been teaching on the Holy Spirit throughout that summer, just talking from the, from the epistles about the, the activity, because I don't know what's coming. But I've had my wife have a breakup in the doctor's office. I've had Paul Kane coming to me and telling me, I'm now Ephraim, and who knows what could happen next. Well, I found out in August. We took a group of people down to the southern part of the Oregon coast. There was... Uh, a guy down there who's a four-square pastor from Seattle. His name was Steve Richards. And he was from the Seattle Revival Center, three churches that had come together for uh, because they'd been out to Toronto together. Anyway, he came in, and uh, I took 20 people from my church there, most of them a lot of young people. And by the end of the night, the young people are speaking in tongues, slaying on in the spirit. You couldn't get those kids to do anything. Okay, they're church monsters. Do you know what I'm talking about? They're down there screaming. I mean, that Sunday I, I walked into church and, um, and I open up in prayer and there's a presence of God I've never experienced before. Never experienced before. And... All these people that I took to the meeting, they went off like a Saturn rocket. I mean, people are laughing. I, I didn't even get, the worship hadn't even started, and people are going ballistic. Here's the reason why I'm telling you this, all right? It's because right now, I mean, I just read this morning, and I was going to read it to you, but I won't take your time. I'm just going to tell you exactly what it is. Right now, in, um, in a lot of the military schools, Historic military schools here in the U.S., they are now mandating teaching woke ideology, Marxism, and everything else that we have warred against for the last six decades. This, this stuff, it's, it's pandemic, not only throughout the military, but it's in our school system, it's everywhere. And, and people rightfully are beyond concerned and we should be. But here's what I want to tell you. Let God be true 
and let everything else be a lie. That parrot was very real on my shoulder, but it was an inferior reality. So we need to arm ourselves, guys. God poured out his spirit in Reedsport, Oregon. People came from California, from Washington, to my little stinking small town that was 11% unemployment. People crawled from a tent that I put on my property to their car. I had the chief of police showing up to our meetings. He was a Christian, and, he, and he's like, hey, <laughs> I get it, guys, but you're going to have to calm down a little bit. Okay, okay, this is, yeah, this is a little weird. Uh, people would come in. Guys, we had a lady come in. I just want to share this with you. If, if you get tired of listening, feel free to leave. Lady came in. Well, we were having these dreams, okay? Larry Randolph, Larry Randolph called us out and said, I'll see you and your husband are getting night deposits. So we're having these dreams. So it's like they come in like a bank of airplanes. It's like one week, three, four nights a week. We're just, whoa, what does this mean? I'm down at the office. I got a phone call from Cindy. Honey, I had the weirdest dream. I'm like, what? What? By this time, it's like, what? She said, I'm driving in our Ford Explorer. We didn't have a Ford Explorer. She said, I'm driving in a Ford Explorer, and I see fish jumping over here. So I pull off the road. And I got my fishing pole in back, and I threw it in. And she said, I thought I snagged the bottom, but when I pulled it up, it was like a bottom fish. While she's telling me that, this car is pulling into the parking lot of the church. It is a Detroit cruiser. It looks like a front room on wheels. Comes bouncing into the parking lot. The door flies open, and this girl rolls out of the front looks at me and says, I've been clean and sober for two weeks. Is there anything here for me? And she's telling me about her bottom fish while this is going on. And I would never classify people, in, you know, in, but I'm telling you, if anybody came, because she found out she'd been hooked on drugs since she was 14 years old, she's in her 30s and she looks 50, you know. I said... Because we got the 10 out there. All right. I said, yeah, there's something here for you. She showed up that night. And it was chaos. I mean, people were dancing, singing. Everybody had something. They were banging and a banging and a wicking and a whacking. Everything was going. She saw all that stuff and she said, what the heck? She found herself a tambourine. She's out there dancing with everybody else. She thought that's what church was. She got, gave her life to Jesus. We didn't see her for, uh, for three weeks because she went into rehab with her kids. She showed back up to church. She brought her brother with her. Her brother had gone through $800,000 in three years in alcohol, drugs, and gambling. He had lost his son. Six-year-old boy got hit by a car in a construction site. And it just wiped him out. He's 36 plus years old in my, and he's got cirrhosis of the liver. She said, can you pray for him? We're like, well, that's kind of what we do. So we prayed for him. Pain hit the floor. And, and, and when he got up, he says, I, I, f I think I'm better. I feel okay. We started talking to him, found out that he was a drummer. We needed a drummer, so I put him on the worship team. I said, you are called this day into the worship team, you show up. His wife saw the change in it. She came to church, rededicated her life to Jesus. Three weeks later, mom shows up. Okay, mom's coming in to check us out. She comes in and says, well, I don't care much for church. Well, she owned one of the preeminent watering holes there in Reedsport. I mean, all the blue-collar guys would go in there, you know, and close out the day, so to speak. She came in, sat down, and says, I don't care much for church, but I can't deny the change in my kids. So she came two or three weeks, arms folded, looking like a toad on a log, you know, just staring. 
And uh, she came up after two Sundays and said, okay, I'd like to be prayed to be filled with renewal. She didn't know what to ask for. She'd heard people talk about renewal. She said, I'd like to be prayed for renewal, but I don't want to fall down. (laughs) But she's seen people fall down. I said, well, we can manage that. Just have a seat. So Cindy and I got behind her, and we began to pray for her. And she screamed. This is a 70-plus-year-old woman. She began to scream, I'm on fire. I'm on fire. I'm on fire. And I thought, what have we done? So I walked around (laughs) to the front of her. Her glasses are steamed up. I can't see her eyes. What I didn't know, she'd been given six weeks to six months to live. She had incurable leukemia. If that didn't take her out, she had two other diseases that were going to take her out. She went back to the doctor that week. He came in, took blood because they're tracking the advance of the disease. He came in and said, "Uh, we made a mistake. (laughs) Took more blood. I think they came in three times. I could be wrong. I know for sure it was two, but I think it might have been three. And finally he came back in and said, listen, you're in complete and total remission and we don't understand how that happened. She said, do you mean I'm healed? I can't say that. But what I can say to you is you don't need me anymore. Here's the deal, guys. Here's the deal. We could have lived with the reality of 11% unemployment. We could have lived with the reality of addiction out of control. We could have just said, sang with Doris Day, whatever will be, will be. We could have lived with that. But we determined, let God be true and let everything else be a lie. That woman began to send people from her bar into our church. Her daughter, who came in and got saved, pulled people, the the worst cases, of course, into my sanctuary, all right? I'm just telling you, this, this is how this all happened. I'm done, but I'm not, because I feel, but the the takeaway for us here today is we're facing some giants in our nation, okay? We're facing some things that are, um, are so disturbing. I just got back from Ukraine. I'm actually the international part of Hope for the Harvest. I've spent, uh, Craig Nelson, you all know Craig Nelson. Anyway, he's talking to me over the years about uh, about Ukraine, Ukraine, Ukraine. Well, I had this thing in my heart about Spain. And um, anyway, I don't have time to go into that. But so anyway, he says, oh, I'm not going to Spain, but I'm going to Ukraine. But let me see if I can arrange something in Spain. So I ended up going to Ukraine. Life-changing. I met all these people. Anyway, so we're, listen, we're in the middle of this thing, and I'm getting calls back. I mean, just, you can't imagine, guys. I mean, I'm talking to people who've come. I, we, we worked in a refugee camp for a while, um, several weeks back. I've, it's been about a month now. The story's coming away from there. It's, it's beyond heartbreaking. I went through Austerwitz, okay, because we were staying in Poland, in Krakow, I've, and, and, I, and I'm thinking, how horrible. I can't imagine. I can't even begin to fathom the twisted wickedness that people would adopt to do what happened in those places. And then I go into Ukraine, and it is worse. We're facing giants. How are we going to respond? It's a simple process. The fervent, effectual prayers of righteous men and women make much power available, mighty in its working. Psalms 149, and I'm closing with this. Honestly, this is my last and final close. I want to read it to you and we're done. Uh, 
I'm old school. I like Bibles. I, I lose pages on the tablet. They go and they never come back. <laughs> Psalms 149. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. Come on. And his praise in the congregation of the godly ones. Let Israel be glad in his maker. Let the sons of Zion rejoice in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing. Let them praise to him with the timbrel and the lyre. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He will beautify, he will beautify the afflicted ones with salvation. Is that true? Let God be true. Right? Let the godly ones exalt in glory. Let them sing for joy on their beds. The bed is usually where I do most of my quality worrying. Right? In the middle of the night, usually. He says, let it be a place of joy. Verse 6, and here it comes. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance on the nations, punishments on the people, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron to execute on them the judgment written. This is the honor of all his godly ones. Praise the Lord. How's that? Application, when you leave here, find people of common passion, common vision, join yourselves together and begin to go vertical. Guys, I, I've, I'm going to write a book and I'm going to chronicle some of these things and get them out. Not because what happened to us is, is so unusual. or unique. It happened in a lot of places. But, but for me, okay, I, <laughs> growing up, I was, I was diagnosed as chronically average. Okay? <laughs> I mean, if... If you're, if you're really dumb, you know, you get lots of help. And if you're really smart, you get scholarships. But if you're average, well, you're just out of luck, pal. So we have a, have a process that we put in place that we didn't get out of a book. We didn't get out of theology. It was birthed in us by the Lindsays and Christ for the Nations. And we want to pass on some of these things to you. The problem I've experienced is that when I sit down to write, well, right after the word preface, I get writer's block. So pray for me. All right, I'm done, guys. <laughs>